We're delighted this afternoon to have with us uh, Dr. Bud Hall. Um, Bud is a Professor of Community Development at the University of Victoria in Canada and has deep uh, knowledge, experience and expertise of participatory research. He's been a, a Chair of Adult Education, a Dean of Education and the founder of the Office of Community-Based Research at the University of Victoria. We're also delighted that uh, with his long-term collaborator, Rajesh Tandon, um, he helped steer uh, the ACU's work uh, through our Engage community. And uh, Bud today is going to be talking to us about global inequalities in knowledge production and distribution. Uh, I think all of us are aware of of global inequality in wealth, in different dimensions of, of social development, um, but I think much less widely known uh, and understood are the disparities in the production and access to knowledge. And it's something which definitely resonates uh, with us at the ACU. We're extremely concerned with um, the equality of, of partnerships and exchange of knowledge, production of knowledge between um, academic institutions in, in the Global North and the Global South. Um, but I think uh, Bud's talk today will go beyond that, how we engage with different kinds of knowledge systems. Um, and so we look forward to being um, uh, provoked and, and, and challenged by Bud this afternoon. Um, and as a uh, participatory research, I do understand that there will be participation as well expected of you in the audience. So um, look out for that. Over you, over you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Alex. Lovely. Thank you, everybody, for finding some time to be here. I see some friends of mine for many, many years, and some more recent friends. And it's always <coughs> nice to be at the ACU. Um, one of the things I I, I uh, usually do, we usually do in uh, in, uh, in British Columbia, is that we acknowledge the uh, the territory, the indigenous territory where we live and work. And in my case, that's the that's the Lekwungen territory, which these days is called Victoria. Uh, it sounds a bit colonial, doesn't it? It's the same Victoria that you might remember from one of the queens here. Um, and uh, that's, that's, the, that's the home of, of the uh, Esquimalt and uh, Wasanich uh, speaking uh, peoples. And I am a descendant, I'm a colonial uh, occupier, settler, uh, by by heritage, my heritage is uh, is uh, is English, and my great grandparents um, achieved middle class status by obtaining illegally land which belonged previously to the Halalt First Nations, a group of people in smaller numbers, but who are still living in the Chimanus River Valley, uh, just north of uh, Duncan on Vancouver Island. And I say that um, because it has to do with the theme, this theme, global inequalities in knowledge distribution and production, implications for universities. The fact that I am a professor uh, and I'm speaking here is, uh, is directly due to the privilege which I have, which my family uh, obtained uh, from, the, from the fact that they were able to get 200 acres of very fine farmland uh, in 1870. Um, a lot of the work you see on inequality in knowledge, it's called the global inequality in knowledge production. But I was thinking when I was doing this, you know, that's not really right. Uh, that's, that's, and, and the focus, a lot of this focus, and you'll see in some of my graphs, come out of uh, a, a reference to academic knowledge production. Uh, but, but in fact, that you know, we need to keep in mind that, uh, that the academic knowledge production is a very narrow part of, of the actual knowledge which is created in, you know, in the world. And so I, <coughs> I've turned this around and talking about, about global inequalities in knowledge distribution because there's no question because, but the majority of the majority world, which is most of the world outside of Europe and North America, uh, produces more knowledge than uh, we do in, uh, in England or Canada and all of these countries, these like-minded countries. 
But uh, the knowledge that we are aware of, the kind of knowledge that comes into books that you'll find in this bookshelf and the British Library and almost any library in any university, probably don't reflect that. So what am I going to talk about, I wonder? <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I'm gonna, I've got some, some uh, slides which will uh, graphically uh, show you uh, what other researchers have found out about uh, knowledge inequalities. I want to talk a little bit about how do we account for uh, these inequalities. I, I want to then do, I've got two participatory, as uh, Alex uh, advertised, two participatory parts. I want to ask you, uh, you know, for just a few minutes of uh, kind of you, just whoever's next to you, just to talk a little bit about what can be done, and then I'd like to hear a little bit, not everybody, but some of you, what can be done. And then I thought, since we're here, this is the headquarters, the imperial headquarters of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, and we, a lot of us, a lot of clever people, here we all are. Uh, what, what do you think an association uh, like this, which is, it, it's a w wonderful association, a majority of the members are coming from the majority world. And there are very few associations or venues or places where you can speak where that's the case. That is the case here. This is a global uh, a global uh, membership organization. So perhaps the, uh, the Association of Commonwealth Universities is uh, in a good place to be able to do some things about all of this. So that's, that sound all right? Is that all right, Peter, is that all right? Peter says yes, okay. <laughs> Ron and Peter, two people who I've, who I've read and then uh, have been mentors of mine for years are both here, so it's quite terrifying. Even as old as I am, it's still terrifying when you see people like that in the room. Um, we'll, have to, you know, we'll have to do some screening, I think, for the next one. Yeah. Um, now, this is, this is a, obviously it's a, a variation of, of, a, of a world map. And what is the scale, you may wonder. This was done, this was done in 2011, so it's probably changed. The scale used to, to, uh, uh, to, to do this representation is the global production of academic knowledge. So you see, you see this, uh, this, this big blue thing here. This is the US. This dark blue is slightly smaller thing on top. That's Canada. This whole great big thing, by the way, which is much bigger than North America in real life. This is Latin America. This is England, way out of proportion to its size. And these are all kind of Western European countries. And this, what is this? What is that? That's a, that, that little skinny thing? Africa, which is much bigger than Europe. And then you can see the dark blue over there is China, which would be even bigger now. Australia is... Actually, Australia looks about, about right, uh, you know, in terms of the way we're used to seeing it. So this gives you, you know, in a, you know, in a, a fairly dramatic uh, display um, what, you know, what, what, the, what the world of, uh, you know, the, of what's counted as academic knowledge uh, actually uh, looks like. Here's another interesting... Uh, uh, chart. This is the top 25 social science publications cited in Google Scholar. And you can run down this list. It starts, the, the top one is the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn. Second one is diffusion of innovations by Everett Rogers. Number three is pedagogy of the oppressed by Paulo Freire. You think, wow, maybe this is interesting. Paulo Freire is the only person from the global, uh, the global, a uh, majority, global majority, you know, a developing country of, uh, you know, on the whole list. The only woman on the list is Jean Lave, who is writing with Etienne Wenger, who does all of that good uh, partnership, uh, uh, you know, research on learning, learning partnerships. This, this is it. Um, <coughs> they're 100% white male, 100% with the exception of, of Paolo, 100%, uh, you know, European uh, folks. This is another, another vision of the world done by World Mapper. This is on science papers published in 2016. And um, th this is Alaska. I'm sure Alaskans don't do that much. I think they, <laughs> I'm sure there's not that many people in Alaska. But I think they get 
counted in with the United States. So they, you know, I don't know. And look at Canada, again, tiny little thing there, and Latin America. So it's, it's very, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite similar. In fact, it's more dramatic. It's more dramatic than the total academic uh, knowledge production. Uh, that you saw in the first slide, and you can see Europe. So basically, basically, you've got Europe, you, you've got North America, you've got Europe. Australia is even a little bit smaller. So it's not, you know, not it holding its own. And this would be Japan going out like that. How about Nobel Prize? Alaska doesn't have a single Nobel Prize. <laughs> very similar, very similar. I, you know, the, I, the, the, the Nobel Prize winner that I've associated with all my life is Rabindranath Tagore. And that was, a, what was that, 1908? I think he got the Nobel. How many, how many Indian poets or majority world poets have we seen since then? I don't think any. So you, you get the idea. ISI, this is the web of science. Um, this, this, this categorizes uh, articles per million uh, per capita, per million capita, and the darker the darker colors indicate the top fifth. These are quintiles, and the the lighter colors are are the lowest. So again, you see that um, uh, you've got you know North America, you know producing a lot of articles per person. Europe, again, this map is more a more normal projection. So you see how small Europe is, you know, compared to uh, like Africa or Latin America. Uh, and then you can see the others. And so obviously, um, you, you've got here in Brazil and Argentina uh, and Chile, you've got, you know, not bad in terms of academic articles uh, being produced. South Africa has got a little bit. Africa itself, very little. Australia, again, is producing quite a bit. Uh, inequality, of, uh, inequality of knowledge production. This is content content creation across continents. Uh, the green bar <clears throat> are, is uh, Europe. The blue bar is North America. The purple bar is Asia. The orange bar is Latin America. The dark blue is Oce Oceania. The red one is uh, Middle East and North Africa. And the yellow one is Africa. And this is academic articles. This is collaborative coding. And this is domain registrations, internet website domain registrations. And again, you can see that basically 40%, 40, 40, about 70% of content creation comes out of uh, Europe and North America, with Asia picking up you know, a little bit, a bit more, and Africa, one, let's see, one, two, about 2.1% of, of knowledge uh, content creation. Uh, um, so, what, what accounts for these inequalities? Well, th th there are a number of, of, of theories. Uh, I've been influenced a lot by the work of uh, Boaventura de Sosa Santos, who, who, who's the, the fellow who's brought this term epistemicide to us. Um, epistemicide is the, uh, is the killing off of knowledge systems by the imposition of other knowledge systems. And so if you read uh, Boa, Boa Ventura's work, you'll see that, that as the, the European knowledge system spread some 500, 550 years ago, uh, spread out you know, through, through different parts of the world, uh, it didn't go uh, meekly, it didn't go hand in hand, it didn't go looking for friends, it went uh, as the truth. It came to Canada, it came to, you know, when, it, when my, when my great-grandparents came to our island, they assumed that whatever they knew, and they didn't know very much, they probably didn't, had more than four or five years of elementary school, they assumed that whatever they, knowledge they had was superior to any knowledge that the indigenous people, who had been there for 10,000 years, living quite comfortably, uh, would have had. There was just this assumption, and that, that process of, of, uh, of diminishing or killing off um, knowledge systems uh, is, is called epistemicide. Um, another of the, another uh, of the more contemporary uh, uh, phenomena which is exacerbating this, uh, 
you know, the, the, uh, the inequality of knowledge distribution and production are the ranking systems. And you may say, well, what do you mean the ranking systems? How could those? I'll give you an example. I just came about, uh, well, a month and a half ago from Malaysia. Malaysia, the Ministry of Education, wants there the wants a number of those, the universities in Malaysia to become world quality in order to become world quality they are they are given specific instructions that they should not publish in national journals they should seek out international journals of a sufficient quality that would get them some kind of uh, global recognition so in spite of the fact that there are in Malaysia a whole number of very good journals, both in Bahasa Malaysian and in English, um, they, are, they are discouraged from, from publishing in those, and they are told that they should publish in something that would be probably you know, a more, uh, uh, you know, that would rank higher you know, in the Web of Science or the ISI qualifications. Now, over time, over time, and I was, you know, talking with, over time, that's going to, to weaken, you know, the, the, the local journals, and some of them will go out of business, some, some people will forget. In fact, how did I say that in Malaysian? Because they're so used to saying it, but they will never be, they will never be as, as agile in the English language as somebody who he was born and raised and raised and uh, went to higher education in England or even in Canada, that colonial country. So the ranking systems, you know, you think what you might about them, and I know they're not popular, uh, you know, amongst, uh, you know, most people anyway, but you perhaps hadn't thought about the way that they, that they, they uh, interact in this uh, kind of knowledge distribution and production. A third thing is the availability of, of research funding, and Alex and I were just speaking um, before this about the situation. If you are, uh, if you are a researcher um, at uh, Gulu University in uh, northern Uganda, the only chance that you have to get uh, uh, funding for your research is if you have a partnership with somebody in the UK, somebody in Canada, somebody in Norway, somebody in Sweden, and they want to do international work, and you will be the local researcher, the national researcher. There is no uh, research granting council in Uganda. There's no place that you can, you know, write your proposal, you know, like you have in the UK, or like we have in Canada. And so, this, av this availability, particularly in countries, uh, you know, in countries of uh, Africa in particular as a whole continent, but in the poorer countries of Asia, uh, you know, uh, Central America is, is another, another thing. <coughs> another thing is the differential workloads. Now, I was talking earlier today with, with Dr. Fransman, who's here from the Open University, about workloads, and apparently workloads are quite, a, quite an issue here in the UK now. Um, but uh, when you speak with uh, colleagues in, at Makerere University or Zumbe University or Legon or any of the universities in Africa, the, 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 you know, the amount of time, the number of courses that they teach, the amount of time that they, that they have to do research, um, the, the number of extra jobs they may have to take on in order to keep the family moving because salaries are so low, um, makes it very difficult for you know, for, for them to, you know, to produce articles at the same rate and same speed, you know, as somebody as, you know, like myself working in at the University of Victoria in Canada with very, you know, really nice, nice conditions. An another barrier to another problem um, are uh, market price, the, the, the way that the market uh, interferes with knowledge production and distribution. Um, I tell this story that Rajesh Tandon and I worked for about three years on a really good book, which we did with the Global University Network for Innovation on, on uh, engagement and knowledge, democracy, and higher education. Um, and it, there was a contract, Goody had a contract with Palgrave Macmillan, and the book was, you know, 
the book was great. It's a great book. And we were very proud of it. And so afterwards, we were going around different places doing, you know, book launches. And I ended up with about six of these. They're very heavy books, so I could only carry six of these at, at McCary University in Kampala. And, and, but they'd given me some flyers. <coughs> so, you know, with discounts, deep discounts. Okay, so great. So, you know, I give a talk about what was in the book. I give out a few, you know, a free one to the chancellor, another one to the minister of education couple to some other people, and then other people, oh, that's a great book, we'd really like to get a copy. Oh, well, here's, here's the flyer. The flyer, the 20% discount still left the book costing 90 pounds, 90 pounds. And we, we, we you know, we, we wrote a note to Paul Grave Macmillan. They are, they are very tight. They are very tough. They are not interested in this kind of, you know, silliness. Uh, making work. So the, you know, you can, so, so the ability, the ability to buy books, the ability to have access to the, these books, the ability for you to produce a book coming out of that kind of, a, you know, that kind of environment, uh, you're at a real disadvantage. And this is why, um, you know, so many of us, I'm sure many of you in this room are, you know, push, are always moving uh, in the direction of open access. It's, there's a, it's a revolution in, in these. Um, language vulnerabilities. Well, you know, to, to be a native speaker of English is, in this world is just an extraordinary privilege. And, and, and English is, I think, only the third or fourth most spoken language. But it really dominates the internet, really dominates you know, business. It's, uh, it's all over the place. And, um, you know, and if you are. You know, if you are working in, you know, in English as your third, your fourth, your fifth, your sixth uh, language, and you only use it for, you know, your academic papers, just imagine if we were, if all of us in this room were, were having to write our papers in Arabic, Chinese, Japanese. Some of us may do that. Imagine what that, how, how difficult that would be. Um, not to mention the previous fact that I said is that some of the languages that uh, people think in, naturally thinking their mother tongues are no longer seen as you know the, uh, the kinds of languages which are appropriate for carrying academic knowledge um, a couple of other things I wanted to say a bit more about uh, epistemicide you know, somebody was asking me once well you know you talk about epistemicide and you know boa and all these people how do you account for it? I mean, wh how was it that the this kind of Western canon got spread around so 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 widely? And the person who I have read who influenced me is this fellow uh, Gross Fugel, and he talks about the four um, epistemicides of the 16th century. And if I can remember them, they are as follows. These are all things that happened uh, around knowledge. But they obviously happened around knowledge and conquest. So the 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 awareness that um, that that imperial and and conquering um, you know forces had about the role of knowledge you know is is, is ha, was very astute. So for example, the the Andalusian, the uh, the Iberian Peninsula, the when when uh, when when Christian Spain expelled uh, you know Arabs. From the Iberian Peninsula, they 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 destroyed the libraries that uh, had been established there. And the one library whose statistics I know was the Cordoba Library. Mm -hmm. The Cordoba Library had 100,000 volumes. 100,000 volumes. This is in the 16th century. The largest the largest uh, library in in Christianity, which probably would have been a Latin library, was in a monastery in Italy was 10,000 volumes. That library was destroyed and all the other libraries in Spain were destroyed. Um, second, uh, 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 I'm not getting probably the, the order of the 16th century, these events, uh, but uh, the, the, they all took place during that century. Uh, a second, um, you know, knowledge um, uh, epistemicide that happened was the, particularly the, the, the Spanish uh, occupation of Latin America, and people who've studied that, um, you know, we're aware of the 
of the military and the, you know, the, the plundering for gold and silver, which in fact financed the, the European expansion to a large extent. But what I didn't realize until I was reading from the Gros Fugel is that that they deliberately, that the, the conquistadores deliberately destroyed what were called the codices. The, the Inca people uh, didn't have a written alphabet, but they had a pictographic alphabet uh, with a kind of encyclopedia carved into stones, and those were destroyed. And the similar, uh, the similar um, tablets that the Aztec people had in Mexico. So, you know, there, somebody realized that that conquest, you know, one part of conquest is military might, another part of conquest is knowledge superiority. Um, a, third, a third is, well, is probably uh, obvious, slavery. In order to, in order to uh, carry out slavery, one has to dehumanize the people who are uh, slaves. And so there is a systematic uh, dehumanization of Africans in spite of the fact that Africa is where all human life began and Africans were living, you know, quite well, you know, for I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of years before, you know, any Europeans came along. But nothing, they, the, 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 the knowledge base, nobody ever, you know, asked, you know, brought slaves in order to learn from them. They were all brought, of course, for, for slave labor. So that was, a, and the fourth, the fourth thing that happened uh, during, the, during that uh, 16th century was the, the um, th there was a huge outbreak of, <clears throat> of burning at the stake of witches. Um, witches, uh, women from, from uh, you know, northern India and, and into Europe who were uh, practicing, you know, the knowledge, the, the, the life-saving, you know, caring knowledge that they had acquired uh, as women and were, and to, to, to the degree to which that knowledge posed a threat, they were branded as witches and burned at the stake. Um, you know, as I was saying, we in Canada, in Canada, we, you know, people like myself came into the place uh, you, in, in this concept of terra nullis, you know, the idea we were told, uh, my, my great-grandparents were told, well, there's nobody there. You know, nobody there, all those years, nobody there. And so, uh, you know, and so later on it discovered, oh, well, there were some people there. And in, in my island, for example, there's, we, we know that there have been people 15,000 years on my island. That means, means 14,800 uh, uh, years pre-contact, living perfectly well, eating, sleeping, you know, watching over the, you know, the, without a shortage of fish, you know, without the forest fires, all of that stuff. And then suddenly, suddenly Europeans arrived, and that knowledge, that knowledge base, that those, those ways of knowing, you know, were, were absolutely, were silenced. Um, people, one, one of the main ways in which knowledge is shared in indigenous societies in our part of the world is through ceremony. So uh, potlatch ceremonies, Sundance ceremonies, all of these were illegal. They were said they were illegal. You couldn't practice um, the you know your own spiritual tradition, which is another way in which people. So you know this is this is, uh, and and we're, you know we we had in 2015 we um, Canada uh, produced a, a truth and reconciliation report, which is a report of the impact of. Uh, the residential schools. So the the idea, the the colonial idea, was that the best way for indigenous young people to you know get ahead would be if they would be more like the uh, white uh, European settlers. And so a series of schools, residential schools, were set up you know all across the country. The last one didn't close until 1990, um, and children were forcibly taken from their communities and taken to these schools where they were forbidden, of course, to speak their own language, and they were not, uh, they were not encouraged to, you know, to be in touch with their own culture. And we are, we are seeing the results of that. And so this, this report has, um, you know, has, has 
uh, rendered this visible to all of us. And that, now there's a there's there's a there's a, a lot going on. And so in my university, for example, I I teach my community development programs in a, a public administration unit. Seems strange, I know, for community development. Anyway, we have a committee. It's called the Committee on Decolonization and Indigenization of the Curriculum Committee. You know, I never would have thought that was possible. That's because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So this is something that, you know, we're working on. Um, some of you will know the work of Catherine Odara Hopper, who's a, a Ugandan woman who works at the University of South Africa, or Wangola, in Douala, Wangola, who is an independent scholar uh, from, from Busoga Kingdom in, in Uganda. They have uh, brought to our attention that, you know, in a country like Uganda, uh, it's illegal to teach a university course in any language other than English. Illegal. And that, that if, you, if you want to practice your uh, indigenous spiritual uh, life, if you want to follow you know, uh, an African indigenous spiritual path, you will be ridiculed. And the women and men uh, and the children of families who want to make it are, are humiliated they are mocked, they are laughed at, and, 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 and the, the, the colonization, this is a country where, our country, co the colonial settlers, we came and we never went away. Uganda, that's not true. Colonial settlers came, they did their damage and they took off, so it's, now it's just Ugandans there. And, but the, the job, the, the, the colonization of the mind is so, so deep that young people, associate modernity with Western knowledge and English language, and they view with suspicion uh, people who are more and more, fortunately, more and more, raising the question about, you know, what is there that's powerful? What is there in, uh, you know, indigenous uh, traditions? Um, I already went through this. I see, I see what I've done is I've done all of these. So, done that one, done that one, <laughs> done that one. Um, this, is, this is the, uh, I thought I wouldn't remember that at all, but I remembered it all. Uh, this, is, uh, this is just the, um, what does this say? The vitality of the world's languages. So 57% of the world's languages are more or less okay. English would be one, Chinese, Spanish, French, I suppose. But all of the rest of the language, so about a little, about 60%, let's say, 40% of the, of the languages of the, in the world, and of which there's some four or 5,000, 40% of the languages in the world are vulnerable. They're definitely endangered, severely endangered, critically endangered, or extinct. So, you know, this, this is, you know, you can see the, you know, so, you know, what the impact is for for academic, for, for, you know, for knowledge distribution. Um, this, I just, a friend of mine wrote an article and reminded me of Franz Fanon. Some of you, some of you will remember Franz Fanon. Peter will remember Franz Fanon. Don't you re don't remember Franz Fanon? Anyway, 1962. Um, he wrote this. My friends, he said, the European game is definitely over. If we want to see humanity advance for Africa, for the world, we need to invent and discover a new way of thinking. And here's my, my friend Boa. He says, <coughs> there will be no global social justice without global epistemic justice. Interesting, isn't it? Think about. And what, you know, what I tied this back to what Alex was saying. We, we talk a lot about inequalities. You know, the recent, the Oxfam report every year is terrifically done, talks about, you know, income inequality and wealth inequality, but the knowledge inequality is a very powerful part of inequality, and that's the part that those of us in universities are engaged in. We, and we, not only are we, you know, are we perpetrators, <laughs> inadvertently or not, but we also have some agency. We have some, some ways of, of doing something about it. So what I suggest is that, that you sit two or three of you together for just a few minutes, five minutes, let's say, 
and brainstorm some ideas. What can be done? You've seen, you know, the, the horrible picture I've just painted. So what could be done, or you may have a story about what is being done. I know some people, Carrie Harmon, for one, is involved in her Birkbeck College and their committee on decolonization, so she's doing something. Others of you may have some stories. So I want you to just take, take a few minutes. Uh, what are some thoughts that you have uh, about what is to be done from the back anywhere? Anybody can. Hey, Ben. Um, we, we were talking about open access publishing. OK. Um, and you're saying well, is it, is it can be a good thing. Yes. But actually, can also be a barrier, a, a very significant barrier, um, in terms of the, in terms of journal publishing, because the the author processing charges can amount to several months' salary for yes. a lecturer from Nigeria. Yes. So that's a huge yes. barrier then to publish and to, to contribute knowledge. Yeah. Um, so not so, all open access. Yeah. The so, ones so, that are, don't, don't cost you anything is better than the ones that cost you three months' salary. Yeah, so, it's, so actually having your university pay a subscription yes. to access a journal gives you a lot more access. Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so maybe waive them then for, for low and middle income. Thank you. So. Some others? Yes. Um, I'm a member of the Society for Research in higher, into Higher Education um, and also just spent five years working in Ukraine where I helped oh. set up a journal. Um, and one of the things we established for the journal was that whatever language you write in, the journal has three. And okay. if you write in English, there will be a Ukrainian um, um, abstract. Okay. So at least there is that point of access yes. by people in, yes. in the country. Because it's not just a third world problem, it's no, not particularly it's not. a third world problem. Yeah. But there are concerns by the German and the Dutch governments that nothing is being distributed in their languages to their country. So that there isn't that nation building yes. that is coming from the work that their people are doing because it's it's communicated not with them in their language, but with international academics in the lingua franca, which happens to be American. Very, very good point. Yes. I think, I mean, in, in our case, we, we talk a little bit about a particular discipline area or a subdiscipline area, which is international business. Um, and in, the, in that particular area, there, and some of you may be aware, there's a very vibrant um, academic network called the Academy of International Business. So one of the approaches that um, our institution and some others have been taking is working with that network, okay. specifically in a couple of areas. For example, access to, I mean, you talked about market pricing yes. or journals. So, you know, they've been working with Emerald and other publishers to make sure that that issue is addressed. Also in terms of supporting um, emerging uh, regional, sub-regional networks. This has been particularly the case in South Asia and Africa in the last four or five years. Um, the barrier, though, tends to be that that's fine at the kind of regional level, but at the larger international gatherings, they still tend to be very dominated by a northern paradigm of discussion. Okay. But also, we'd be very mindful that if, it's, if, the, if that contemporary discussion is dominated by some very large economies, you know, the Chinas and sure. Indians come to mind, that also has other consequences in crowding out space for, for other countries and voices. Yeah. I'm aware of uh, that we have two of the uh, the editors of a of a new journal, which is I think uh, a, you know a positive step in these directions, and that's uh, Sophie and Sandy Sandy Oliver and Sophie Duncan uh, have are responsible for this uh, journal called Research for All, which is an open access, um, and it's they 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 seek. Um, they seek articles from all over the world, and not just academics, but also you know community uh, community intellectuals and and so forth. And uh, they're look they're always looking for more uh, articles, particularly from the uh, you know the majority world. Uh, but that's another example of something you know that, that concrete that has been done. Are there other, uh, Carrie? I've got a, a, two um, ideas. One is. Um, about universities themselves and like in the UK we have institutional repositories that we're all required to put our work onto but we were just having a discussion about that 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 doesn't actually seem to like in it it's been my experience anyway unless it's changing that you need to request that work if you're going to if you're getting work from other universities but I'm I, I just don't quite understand why it needs to be like that why you know Surely, there's, it can be set up technologically that this stuff can just be downloaded. Mm. I mean, that's kind of the point of it, that it's there. I mean, it's being produced. But I think 
um, an even better idea in, and something else to be thinking about is actually about the ways knowledge is, um, are being produced. And I'm thinking about a wonderful article that was written by an Indigenous scholar in Australia called Lester Rigney. It was written in 1999. And it's about Indigenous research um, approaches and Indigenous um, you know, thinking. And, and, and it lays out a very clear set of principles around creating um, knowledge within Indigenous communities. Okay. Yeah, so. Um, we talked about that as well. Well worth about, looking yeah, at. About really, you know, like really interrogating what our current knowledge systems are based on. And given the fact that, you know, the world is teetering, that we've never been more needed of Indigenous knowledge systems. Yeah. And that actually we need to kind of like, you know, get off our high horse, really, and really kind of like say, what is this knowledge that we're producing? You know, who's, whose voices are louder? And, um, you know, to me, and support the kind of reinvigoration of, in, if, of the Indigenous knowledge systems. Sure. Let me, um, the Association of Commonwealth Universities has very generously invited us to think about, um, Alex, t tell us something, just to stand up and give us a few facts. How many universities are there? How many countries? So give us a, a, a scale. So now we're going to turn our brains towards what can the ACU do? Okay, we, we have, um, I think at the last count, let's see, 520 members just over. 530 uh, members covering the 53 uh, countries of the Commonwealth. So that's a huge range in diversity from Vanuatu to India, Australia, UK, Canada, Caribbean, Africa, South Asia. So um, pretty much every kind of geographical and social setting um, that you can think of. Great, that's fine. Now, thinking about that, uh, you can return to your same group, and uh, each of you has a, if you have any ideas uh, the, for any recommendations uh, for the ACU, um, you know, they may or may not do anything about it, but here's your chance. Um, write them down and, uh, and uh, you know, continue on with your discussion. Now, you know, move further from, you know, what you've been talking about, what is, can be done to now, what can we do as a global network? I'm going to call on uh, one of the people who I admire so much, and that's Ron. I'm sure. What are you, what are your ideas for the association, Ron? I'll tell you what I scribbled down. Um, convene a meeting of major journal publishers to expose the problem and work towards reform. I don't think we realise just how powerful many of the publishing houses are. Okay. Um, we are victims of yeah. their power in the okay. North. Um, and yes. uh, I've, I've yet to see you know, uh, this, this kind of forum in which they're brought together and made to uh, face up to and address uh, these problems. Yes. Great idea. Um, but anyway, I, I wrote that scribbled out one or two other things. I mean, I think what the ACU is do, beginning to do, I think, in terms of encouraging partnerships between the North and the yeah. South is very important, but it, it needs to be quite targeted and precise. We need to think of ways that research collaboration can yeah. be handled. We yeah. need to think of ways in which curricular yeah. collaboration yeah. can be handled. I mean, yeah. you imagine if you have a program in civil engineering in the north and you hook up that course yeah. with another uh, comparable course in the south and you get the students not only to do some engineering together but think about the role of engineer yeah. comparatively in those different societies. Yes. Wouldn't that be exciting? Yes, and think of all the social and cultural gains that could flow from such an arrangement. Now, I know some of this is just beginning to happen yeah. But I think the ACU is especially well placed to develop these kinds of initiatives uh, and conversations. Great, thanks, Ron. I'm sorry to speak again. I want to follow on from Ron. Okay. I, I've been embarrassed. I have an ND student who's a member of a colleague, member of staff at the University of Greenwich. Quite happy to expose us to criticism, and he's uh, been looking at our work in Vietnam, a transnational education provision okay. in Vietnam, and discovered that when it's revalidated, the people in Vietnam are not asked for their views. 
Mm-hmm. And when they try and do Vietnamese case studies, it's a business studies degree, yeah. they're not allowed to do that because there is a standard course that they have to teach. Wow. Can we please, and can ACU yeah. start to encourage universities to recognize the diversity of knowledge and where it comes from yeah. and the localized elements sure. and encourage universities in partnership who are seen as the junior partnership yes. and higher education be so bloody arrogant um, <laughs> to produce material relevant to the context in which it's yes. being taught with their name on it yes. which gives them that prestige yes. and having somebody yeah. with their name on it and I found that was a, a motivator for some of my less publicly or uh, publications oriented stuff when I became out of school yes. something with your name on the front your mother likes it your, your spouse likes it you know, mm. yeah. um, but give that recognition yeah. and identity yeah. to those people as part of a partnership and moving towards more equalisation so developing of um, indigenously developed yes. materials for incorporation Lovely. because international MBAs tend to be very much Chicago dominated yeah. very very well expressed I think, and what, where I feel I fall down, is understanding how different forms of knowledge can um, support each other. Yes. So um, I understand that there are some people who work in their heads with two very different forms of knowledge all the time. It's how they live. So they might have a, a deep... Uh, cultural form of knowledge that they've inherited and grown up with and it's driven their lives and then they've also got um, uh, an external westernized science yes. and they use the two together yes. and I don't understand how they use the two and I would like to and I think that we will get further when we understand better how to use the two. On a really micro scale, where I came from in the UK, it may not be so hugely different from um, parents and mothers challenging clinicians about treatments in hospitals and how hospitals are run. Yes. And you know that I am familiar with, and I do understand that there's high tech knowledge, very scientific knowledge that's immensely valuable that I've gained from personally and there's also a more cultural, socialised knowledge that enriches in ways that are absolutely vital and we need the two. But I only understand it in my tiny context and I'd quite like to understand it in other people's context, not on a grander scale. And I think we don't look at that enough. So we need spaces to yes. have those conversations. Yes. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you on that. So I've just finished working on a UN project around environmental knowledge, okay. where we try to combine science and indigenous local knowledge. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a major global programme. It's very challenging. Mm. But what the UN was doing on every aspect of our work, as well as doing equalities checks on gender, on social background, it was doing knowledge equalities checks. Oh. <coughs> okay, well, you know, was indigenous and local knowledge uh, holders involved yes. in every aspect of the work? Now, that would be a real challenge for ACU. I'm sure yes. you do equalities checks on all your activities. Yeah. Are you doing knowledge yeah. equalities yeah. checks? Yeah. Um, it would be really difficult to do with such a diverse membership. But, you know, when we st- that's, that's what the UN is trying to do. Yeah. And it's a Which challenge. part of the UN? This was the United Nations Environment Programme. Okay. It was the, the international platform, science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services. Okay. <laughs> so, but it's what, basically what, what the IPCC the did for climate change, yeah. it is currently trying to do for okay. biodiversity. That's a good, that's a good. And, of course, yeah. indigenous and local knowledge about biodiversity and ecosystems yeah. is highly valuable, particularly in majority parts of the world yes. and is really undervalued particularly in areas where western science is missing yeah. very good thanks great great to you guys are a smart bunch if you're in my course i give you all top marks <laughs> i sit down and you give the course over to you guys um other people other ideas for the acu we all, i mean we ought to be very well placed having india uh and south asia in the commonwealth ordinary i mean in in the area of uh, proprietary medicines and things, you know, uh, the I- I- Indian uh, drugs manufacturers and things, and through WHO and international agreement, I mean, we have broken open some of the uh, you, 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 you preserves of the traditional companies, and you would have thought that in publishing too, 
I mean, I think in quite a lot of Africa, there's some very, uh, there are, uh, there's a, a market which is fairly vibrant for much cheaper textbooks and so on than, uh, you know, than, 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 than comes out of Western publishing houses and many Western publishers, of course, have established in Nigeria and South Africa and so on. I mean, on this point about journals, we uh, people have no institutional memories, but ACU and the Commonwealth Secretariat in the 90s, when I was director of education in the Secretariat, we had something established by Commonwealth ministers, which was called the Commonwealth Higher Education Support Scheme. And one dimension of that was this business of journal uh, subscriptions. And uh, one, I mean, there's the eternal problem which business people have is that if you, uh, there's a mass market at, at, at uh, you know, 10 pounds a year for journal. The on-run on print for journals is very cheap, but they want to sell 150 pounds subscriptions to the University Library at Legon, Macquarie, and the University of Zimbabwe, and so on. And uh, they were always terrified, as <laughs> any commercial person is, of leakage, you know, that uh, the, 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 the people would give the University Library their copy. I do it myself. <laughs> I, I get one or two journals which, you know, I pass uh, complimentary, which I pass on to a university library on the ground that when I've read it, you know, there are masses of students. And the publishers don't know that you do that. <laughs> That's not why they give you a, a free copy of a, of a journal. But, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's finding the right device, isn't it, to bring the publishers on, on board. I mean, another area where the Commonwealth's done a lot, and I'm sure ACU is involved, is, is in... Uh, <coughs> OERs, Open Education Resources. I mean, the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, which we set up in my time in the Secretariat, is the Commonwealth sort of distance education and open learning um, organisation. And they have had workshops with uh, UNESCO trying to develop international protocols on bringing this on. I'm sure ACU has worked closely with them on that. Uh, Sir John Daniel, who was at the OU, of course, as Vice Chancellor, then was President of the Commonwealth of Learning for a time, uh, took quite a lead in that, I think. Thank you, Peter. Uh, there, I'm sure there are other ideas. What we would like is if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, you know, sharing your your notes. Uh, we'll uh, we'll give them to to Alex and his team, and uh, they'll, uh, uh, you know, if you if you want to continue. You know, if you've got an idea and you, you'd you like to, you know, be in touch, put your name and your email on it. Who knows? I mean, everybody's busy. It's a busy life. But uh, this is how, you know, we're coming together to, uh, to, to have discussions. And why not uh, make it a bit more of a networking meeting? So, so uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Great ideas. And uh, uh, go safely into the night. And, uh, you know, revolutionize all of this stuff. Great. Thank you so much.